I'll read for us the uh, scripture this morning, Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my inequity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was bought forth in inequity, and in my sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear your glad joy and gladness, let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my, all my inequities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings, and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, church. You know, this psalm is one that I believe and I hope will give us hope. Uh, it is one that uh, speaks to the heart of a man who has committed a great sin, one that, that has led him to this place of seeking the mercy and the grace of God. But what's interesting about this psalm and what's interesting about who is writing this psalm and, and how it's coming from King David. Now, if you don't know, so King David uh, was anointed to be king. He was the second king of Israel after King Saul. But King David, up to this point in his life, he had been following the Lord, but there was a point in time in his life where he was not where he was supposed to be. Instead of being with his leaders, instead of following in military action with his soldiers, he decided to stay at home. And going out upon his roof, he saw a woman and lusted after her and called her to his home. And after having been with her, and she came with child. And in order to cover up this sin, this adultery that he had committed, he had called her husband home out of the front lines. But this man, Uriah, was a man of such great integrity, he wouldn't even go in to, to be with his wife because he was away from his men and he wanted to honor the commitment that he had made. But David, doubling down and trying to protect himself from being known for his sin, ended up having and commanded for Uriah to go to the front line where Uriah was killed in battle. So here you have King David, who the scripture is going to tell us is a man after God's own heart. But how could a man after God's own heart, could, how could he create such a, and just do such a great sin? You know, we live in a world of performance. When we perform well, the people praise and encourage us. Performance is our identity. It gives us value. It gives us worth. Even if you look at athletes today, the athletes that perform great, we will disregard and remove any sins or any brokenness or damage in their personal lives because we love their performance so much that we'll turn the cheek and look the other way. When we think about our relationship with God, we oftentimes look at it as a performance before God. That to, in order for God to like us, we must have to perform well. And if we're not performing well, then God must not like us. Church, we need Psalm 51 
Because what we learn in this psalm is that a heart for God is not about perfection. It's about humility. It's about pursuit. It's about coming before God, even in our brokenness and in our sin, and seeking redemption and healing from the Lord. So when we look to the psalm, one of the things that I want us to, to start with is the understanding of David. David was going to follow King Saul. And King Saul was the first king of Israel. He was appointed by Samuel. And when he was anointed king, he started out okay. But over time, his insecurities and his pride began to get in his way. And there came a point in time in Saul's life and reign where right before he was going up to fight the Philistines, he went and offered unauthorized burnt offerings on the altar of the Lord. And this was an absolute no-no because that was left for the priest to do. But he positioned himself as a priest and there was consequences for his sin. 1 Samuel 13, 14 says, but now your kingdom shall not continue, was what Samuel says to Saul. The, the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, speaking of King David, and the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded. And we hear that and we read that and we think, well, of course, obviously, because Saul did sin. Saul did make mistakes. He did turn away from the Lord. He stopped trusting in him. He started to follow other gods. That, that's right for Saul. But what about David? David was a man who had so much blood on his hands. God wouldn't let him build the temple. David was a man who committed adultery and committed murder. David was a man who counted his army and built pride within himself. David was a man, but still was a man who God said he was after his own heart. How? How can this be? How can we see this man and how can we come to understand his journey with the Lord and how God would love him and exalt him even in the midst of his sin? I think when we look to Psalm 51, we see it. Because in the reality, you know, we are not oftentimes celebrated and honored in, in the best of times. It's really when we're at our worst where God can do his very best. It's when we're broken and we're at the very lowest of lows when we can truly test what's within our hearts. And this is what I believe David's gonna show us and I pray give us hope. So what does David say? He begins his psalm very, very immediately going and seeking the mercy of God. He says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Boldly asking him to blot out, which is to stricken from the record. So if you think about if you're in court and somebody says something and they say, strike that from the record, it's to be completely removed. The jury can't think about it, can't add it in their discussion and deliberation. It is completely gone. And he's asking the Lord, blot out my transgressions. This is not these passive sins or sins of mistakes. These are intentional rebellious sins that David has committed and he's asking mercy upon the Lord. And then he says, wash me. For my thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. And this washing is like to trample something clean, to step on it and to, to agitate it and rough it up to get the dirt out of it. So that washing process, is, it hurts, it's hard, but it also continues to get us clean and washes them. But in order to be cleansed, which is to be purified. So not only is he saying, hey, get rid of this sin and get, it, get rid of the grossness that's on me, but cleanse me because I still want you to use me. But what David is pleading for, listen, he's saying, according to what? According to his great apology? According to the, the good deeds he's going to do since he sinned? Uh, looking here, according to him just being handsome or wealthy or his position and status as king? What's he clinging to? Where is he seeking forgiveness and mercy from? Not from anything within himself, but everything that's placed in God. When he looks, he says, according to your steadfast love, hesed in Hebrew. Church, this is the love that is not conditioned upon you. It's conditioned upon the promises and character of God. It is unconditional. It's unwavering. It is unmoving. And it is something objectively that God places upon us. 
But then he says, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. David knew there's nothing he could do. He had sinned. He had fallen short of God. He was falling at the feet of God and seeking mercy and grace. There was nowhere else for him to turn. He was seeking the Lord just for his abundant love. So church, when you think about having a heart for God, because that's what we're trying to learn. If David is a man after God's own heart, how can we too have a heart that God desires? How can we be those and be the object of God's affection and love? I think David shows us very simply from the very beginning, a heart for God is expressed in humility. Because when you live life, when you go through life, we can be determined. We can believe that we have everything under control. We can look at our situations in life and we can operate in our own flesh and continue to do the things that we know that we should be doing in order to help try to work out good. But what we've learned from life, if we haven't learned it yet, I promise you will, is that in life, the one fact that we can always come to know is that we have no control. That for us, when we surrender to God and we look to him, there's no amount of good that's ever gonna ease your conscience. There's nothing that you can do to clear your guilty name. It is truly seeking the mercy and grace of God. You know, we just sang the song, who else is worthy? I can promise you, your name does not go next. But praise God, it doesn't. I don't want my name to be glorified. I want his. And it's through his glory and his righteousness that I've been redeemed. I think about a song, a song that I love. It's called, Oh, Come to the Altar. I just want to read some of these words because I will not sing <laughs> publicly. It says, are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin, Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Christ. The reason why we can come to God in great humility is because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins. So the Father's arms are open wide to receive you, to accept you and to love you. But we must be humble. We gotta quit trying to live life in our own strength and come to the realization that there is nothing that we can do that's better than what's already been done in Jesus. So I think about what King David er, continues to say. He says, for I know my transgressions I know my rebellion. I know my intentional sin that has offended you, God. I know it and to you and my sin is before me. And against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your your judgments. David's here confessing and acknowledging his sin. But think about this from what David is sharing with us. Have you ever thought about when we try to justify or excuse our sin, we are going against God, his word, and his spirit. When we try to excuse our sin, diminish it, redefine it, we are going against the very core of who God is and the standard that he set. So when you think about having a heart for God, one of the things that we must do, we must have humility, but we also must guard our hearts from trying to set our own standard. So when you think about your life, we want to set a standard because when we make mistakes and we fall short, we need to try to, we look at the situation and say, okay, you know what? Maybe God's going to grade on a curve. I need that. Church, his grade is Jesus. There's no curve needed. When we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all unrighteousness. You can get a zero on the test, but still get an A because Jesus is your God when you put your faith and trust in him. But he's saying, do not set your own standard. A heart for God submits to his word because we're not entitled to special treatment. 
We look to the very words of God and we trust him. We don't need to redefine what he said. We don't need to try to make excuses. We don't need to try to, to see that our lifestyle needs to be rejudged and redefined. This, word, this book must be obsolete now. So now that I can keep doing what I'm doing. No, there's one standard that has been set and we can't redefine it. I'm gonna tell you a story. I've chickened out about five times this week to tell you this story because it's very, very embarrassing. But it's talking about setting a standard. And when I was 16, I was playing in a golf tournament. I can't believe I'm gonna tell you all this story. And I finished the round of golf and in the tournament and we finished up and I played really well. And it was a golf tournament in Salisbury during the time. And, uh, and then the guy that was keeping my scorecard, you know, he, re he called over to me and he said, so I've got you down for, uh, for one over. I was like, okay. And then he wrote down, you have a 72. I was like, okay. So I got a set, I shot a 72. So he wrote my score wrong on the scorecard. And so I took my scorecard, I was putting my things away and I was like, he got my score wrong. What do I do? I can't believe I'm about to tell you all this. <laughs> I changed my score on a hole. I cheated. I cheated. And I turned my scorecard in and then they, they counted up my score and, and they were like, you know, Mr. Hearn, you, you actually had a 71, not a 72. Is that right? Yes, that's right. I left that day and went home, didn't say anything to anybody. I showed up the next day uh, and I was pulled aside. I was pulled aside by one of the, the people that were there and I was pulled aside by the two people that were playing with me. Uh, and they had, had spent time conferring about the hole that I had changed from a five to a four to ensure that I had a five. And then I was like, yes, I lied. I was like, but now that we've gotten that out of the way, can I play? <laughs> and they sent me home. completely embarrassed, but they set a standard and I didn't meet it. I didn't, I didn't get to plead my case. I didn't get to look at them and say, you know what? Now I'm really sorry for this. So can, can, can I still play? No, because the reality is if they, they make an exception for me, they make an exception for all and the integrity of the tournament is lost. And so they set a standard and I didn't meet it. I didn't like it but I had to submit to it. What's even worse about that story is that almost a year later in, in, in a mat, golf match that I played in high, in high school the next year, we ended up playing a team where one of the guys that I played with was on the other side. And I got in the bus to go home after the golf tournament. And one of my buddies who was on my team looked at me and said, that guy called, said, you were a cheater. And I was, I was completely humiliating. And the reason why I tell you that story church is because I'd give anything in the world to have not have done that and to have made that mistake. But a standard was set and I fell short and I was a liar. And I had to deal with the consequences of my sin, humiliating consequences, even to the point of people questioning my integrity going forward, which they should have. But at the end of the day, when I think about the Lord and I think about what the standard that he sets, even when I break it, it's still the right standard and it's still the one that I should strive for and one that I should work towards and one that we should all be in alignment for. We don't get to redefine the rules. God set them and God's made a way for us and we need to support them and to live for them. And even when we mess up, to get back up and keep honoring him. So then he goes on in verses five through eight. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop 
and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Here we see David in his brokenness, knowing that his brokenness was not something based upon his performance. It was based upon his inception. He was born into sin because we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. David knew that. Nobody needed to teach me how to cheat. I could figure that out on my own. But it's it's honoring the Lord with our life, understanding, recognizing our limitations and sins. But he said, you delight in truth in the inward being. You teach me wisdom in the secret place. The change that we need is not on the outside. The change we need is from within. It's a new heart, a new heart that God promises to give. It's a new life. We become a new creation. Second Corinthians 5, 17. The old has passed away. The new has come. But it's a change and transformation that comes from within and it's one that we need. But then he says, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Hyssop was was a, a purification process. It was used for a leper. Think about a leper. If you had leprosy, you were kicked out of the camp. You were separated from everybody else and you were not allowed back in. But hyssop was something that he used as an ointment to put upon the people to help them in their purification process. And so what David is saying is that I'm an outcast because of my sin, but purge me with hyssop, wash me so that I can come back in and be a part of the fold. But he wanted more than that, church. He wanted more than just to be clean because he then he wanted, he wanted to be washed whiter than snow. He wanted to be purified as hyssop was also used in the purification of priests. So he not only wanted to be clean of his sin, but he still wanted to be used of God in his life. Think about that. A lot of times for us, we think, God, just forgive me of my sin, but I don't want to do anything for you. But David's heart was one that said, I want you to not only forgive me of my sin, but cleanse me so that I can be used. But David in his sin and his brokenness and having been realized his failures, he was losing, he had lost joy in his life. He says, let me hear joy and gladness because he hadn't. All he had heard was was the the worry and the guilt and the shame of his sin. It says, let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Here is the sovereignty of God, not allowing David to enjoy the sinful practice that he was practicing. He withdrew the ability for David to find joy in it because God wanted to get his attention to draw him back what was truly going to bring joy to his life. And it was following him. Sometimes in your life, if you're walking through sinful desires and giving over to it and you lack joy in your life, God's not going to give you joy because that's not where it can be found. And he's going to deny joy to you so that he can point you to the cross of Christ so that joy can overwhelm you when you turn and repent and start to follow him. And he's saying, the Lord, you broke my bones, but I rejoice in that. But here's what I'll say to, my, I say to myself, my wife and I say to each other, man, I hope that I get this right before my bones are broken, right? I hope that I can get it right before the Lord allows a judgment to come upon me or to allow the consequences of my sin to hurt me. I need to get it right. I want to get, I don't want to get it right the hard way. I want to learn through your experiences, not mine. But for us, when we say, he's saying the bones that you have broken rejoice. The standard that you have set, that I've fallen short of, that's taken away my joy. God, you're the one that's taken away my joy, but I rejoice that I couldn't rejoice in my sin because you had something better for me. So when you think about your life, think about a heart for God. Not only is it expressed in humility, not only do we not set our own standard, we trust his standard, but we also have to receive God's discipline. This is hard, but the author of Hebrews really helps us understand this in a great way. He says, it is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons, he's saying. And then he goes on in verse 11 to say, for the moment all discipline seems painful, rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Church, when you think about the discipline of the Lord, the things that I wrote down that it reminds me of, 
that when I'm walking through a season of discipline, that he's my father, that I'm being disciplined, but I'm being disciplined by the God who loves me and has not given up on me. When I'm being disciplined by God, I know that it's because he loves me because his word says so. I know that when I'm experiencing discipline of the Lord, that he's making me stronger and preparing me for what's to come. I know that when I'm experiencing the discipline of the Lord, that he is trying to lead me towards peace and out of my trap of sin and brokenness and dysfunction. The discipline of the Lord is good, church, and we need to rejoice in it. And David says, he says, hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. God, I can't have you look on any of this anymore. I'm so ashamed of it. Wash it away, blot it out, strike it from the record. And then he says, but create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. And that word for create is the Hebrew word bara. And every time it's used, God is the sole source of doing the work. So God is the only one that can create a clean heart in him. God is the only one that can put, renew a right spirit within him. And he knew that and he was seeking God to do the very transformation that he was seeking after as he was broken in his sin. But then he says, cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. And when I hear these words of King David, I'm reminded of the fact that King David watched the Spirit of God leave Saul. As the Spirit of God left Saul and the destruction that followed in Saul's life, David knew the consequences if the Spirit of God left him. David was so broken in his sin, but in so broken in his sin, he didn't allow shame to build up and want to flee and hide from God. He needed more of God and wanted more of his presence in his life. And here we see him, please do not abandon me. Do not leave me. But also when you are with me, do not leave me where I am. Restore me. Restore the joy of your salvation. Restore the joy of the work that God's done in David's life. It wasn't for naught. I tried to find joy in the world and it wasn't there. God, bring me to the right joy, which is in you and in your work and it's in Christ. And for us, we must transition joy from the things of this world into him. But not only do we want to find joy in, his, in the salvation of the Lord, but he said, but uphold me with a willing spirit. Not only did David want to be forgiven of his sin, not only did he want the Lord to give him strength and to hold him up, but David's now saying, I want to want to. I want to do this for me now. I want to be able to do it. I want to follow you, Lord. I want my desire to do the very things that you desire of me. I don't want to be a puppet. I don't want to be one that you just move around. I want to want the very things that you want, God. I want what you want for my life. And here David pleading with the Lord and seeking after him. So when you think about a heart for God in all of these ways, it's about wanting to please the Lord in your life. Every day we wake up is a new day of opportunity. It's a day that we wake up and then we have to make a choice. Are we gonna choose to follow the Lord or are we gonna choose to follow the desires of our flesh? Are we gonna do the things that we want to do? Or are we gonna be attuned to the things that God has for us and that God wants us to do? But what David is showing us is that a heart for God is one where we want to please him, that we want to desire the very things of God, not growing content in our habits and our sins and our brokenness, not trying to seek peace in, the, in all the bad habits and trying to fix all the things. Our desire needs to say, God, I want to please you. And if that means walking away from these things and giving up my hopes and dreams here so that I can go there, then so be it. I want what you want. And that's what we need to chase after. You know, my wife showed me this. Had the notoriety, the name, the fame, if you will, in her work. But God put conviction in her heart that her life needed to be about pleasing him and not chasing her hopes and dreams in the corporate world. And by faith, she left. 
Church, sometimes God's going to call us to do something pretty extraordinary and pretty radical. Are you ready? Are you ready to really say, God, I want what you want? Because I can promise you the first thing he's going to go after is the very thing that you're white knuckling right now. Because he wants to be your everything. And when he's your everything, you have all things. Remember that. So he looks and he shares and he continues on. And he says, after all of this, just grasping the beauty of the gospel and God's transformation, then he's like, I'm gonna tell people. He says, then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. O God of my salvation and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. Here we see him worshiping, having been forgiven of his sin, being restored into right relationship with God. He wants to tell everybody about it. He's so excited about the work that God's doing in his life. He wants to worship. When the gospel becomes real to you, it's gonna change you. The joy that you're gonna experience is gonna overflow out of you. It's not gonna be able to be contained. But some of us, we come to church and we worship as if God's done nothing for us. And David's like, look, I'm here to tell you, I'm the lowest of the low, but God has redeemed me. God has restored me. God has saved me. And I'm going to sing his praises and tell the world about it. And then he goes on and he says, oh Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise for you will not delight in sacrifice or I'd give it. You don't want my religion. You don't want my practices. He says, you will not be pleased with the burnt offering. The sacrifice of God or a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, oh God, you will not despise. And that word for despise is to hold in contempt, to be deemed to be unworthy of respect. He's saying that if the broken and contrite heart, Lord, that I give to you, you will not despise, you will not turn away. If I give you my heart, you will receive me and you'll love me. David in his boldness, one of the things that I love to see in David's expression and all that he's been talking about, knowing that he was born into sin, knowing that he had made mistakes, but knowing that he could be redeemed by God. David had a confidence in the gospel and he hadn't even seen Jesus yet, but he had a confidence in God and what he could do because David was a picture of the gospel for us. And so here we see a heart for God has confidence in the gospel because we've seen it take root and take shape in our own heart. It's brought transformation to our life to the point that we have such confidence that we want to see it in others. I think this is what what Paul was talking about in Romans chapter one, because in Acts chapter nine, he was breathing out violence towards the church. But then in Romans chapter one, after having been saved, he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. He doesn't say that I'm I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who deserves it or everyone who's done a pretty good job in their life or everyone who's done more good than bad or everyone that that has a a good job or, or has good money in the bank or is behaving well. No, it's for those who believe There's no performance in the gospel. It's truly about faith and belief. Because as he says, he would go on to say, it is the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, for faith. The faith of Paul to believe in the gospel and the faith to believe that if he shared it, that others would believe and the faith of them in hearing it to believe and to receive. It's the passing upon faith and faith is evidence of the confidence we have in the gospel. And that gospel is, is purely spoken by Paul and Titus as he says these words. Speaking of Jesus, he says, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness. I'm gonna repeat that. He saved you, not because of works you have done in righteousness. You are not saved because you're worthy. You are not saved because you're a good person. You are not saved because you are awesome. You are not saved because you're parents. You are saved by the works and the righteousness of Christ according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly 
through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The reason why we have confidence in the gospel is because it's not about us, it's about him. The confidence within ourselves is fleeting because we fail and we fall short, but Christ does not. So this is how he says, and he ends this psalm in Psalm 51, where he says, do good to to Zion in your good pleasure. So now he's taking the transformation that he was seeking from God within, and now he's taking it to Zion. He's taking it to his people. He's taking it to those under the mercy and grace of God. He says, do good to Zion in your good, good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Build protection upon the people of God. When you begin to delight in the people of God, when the hearts of the people of God are changed, when they are in your presence and they are seeking after you, then and only then will you delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. Here's the problem, church. We come trying to bring the sacrifices with no heart. And what David is saying is that that's pointless. I'm asking for God to do good in Zion to do good in the place where he dwells when the hearts of the people of God are changed. And it's when the hearts of the people of God are changed that God delights in the work of the people. We could do great things in this community, but if our hearts are not for God, it does not matter. God will not delight in the work that we do if our hearts are not in him. So when you think about a heart for God, church, it's not about your performance. It's not about trying to be perfect. It's just about being humble, coming under the mercy and the grace of God, knowing that we are sinners separated from God. But through Christ, we have access to the Father whose arms are open wide to receive us by faith. We have a heart for God, not only when we come to him with humility, but when we trust his word and his standard, when we submit to the very words of God and the commands of God, when we want to live for him, We grow in our heart for God when we grow in our strength because of the discipline that he brings to our life. It's not about being bitter and angry with God because he's allowing us to suffer the consequences of sin in our life. It's trusting and understanding that when we suffer those consequences, he's making us stronger and he's making us better because he has good works for us. But we must submit to his word, strengthened through his discipline, growing a hunger and a desire to live for him. That's what we need more than anything, to stop desiring the things that we want and desiring the things that he has for us. We need a shift within the very core of our being to desire the things of God. And when we do that and we begin to take steps of obedience, we find that the gospel and its power actually does work. Not only does it change us, but it can change those around us. When we begin to see people saved, we begin to see lives changed and transformed. We grow in our confidence because we see God at work, but our confidence is so low because we're not doing anything with the gift that God's given us. And so I challenge you to have a heart for God, lean in, be humble, come before God, trust Him, seek Him, Be pleased in him, receive his discipline and grow strong and grow confidence and boldness for the Lord. If we want to see change in this world, it has to begin with us. You do not have to have a heart perfect in your performance. It just has to be submissive to the Father. And it's then and then alone, he will do his best work in you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Psalm 51, we thank you that David was humble enough to share with us his broken heart, being confronted by a sin, David fell broken, experiencing a lack of joy in his life, needing to fall to his knees to call upon your mercy and your grace. God, I thank you for the humility that David showed us I thank you for the reminder that David shows us that he was a man after your heart, God, but he wasn't perfect. 
There's too many people in this room right now that think that you are not pleased with them because they are not perfect. God, you're pleased with us because we put our faith and trust in Christ, not because of what we do. And God, I pray that that comforts everyone in here today. May we seek you. May we seek Christ. May we lay down the exhaustive pursuit of performance and perfection and trust in you. May our hearts be turned to you. God, may we be broken for you. May we desire you. God, I pray that none of us leave this room today without having experienced the Spirit of God touching our heart, strengthening our faith, and giving us a greater hunger for you. May today not be wasted in the hearts of your people. God, I pray that your Spirit has spoken. I pray that your Spirit pierces hearts and minds. And I pray that we can leave here changed and inspired. I pray that we can leave here with hope in the gospel, that the performance that we cling to is Christ and it's his righteousness that we take ownership of and it's your will that is to be done in our lives. We trust you and love you. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen.